Thank you, Jim. Well, it's been said that necessity is the father of invention, and that's probably true. And it's also been said that repetition is the mother of learning. And I think that's true also. So at the risk of being a little repetitive, we're, we're still in the 11th chapter of the book of Revelation. And you remember we've talked about as we've gone along some of the difficulties people have in understanding the book. And one of those difficulties is that it doesn't run consecutively. It tells us something and then it goes back and tells us the same thing in different languages or in different pictures as the case may be. And I've given you some examples, for instance the Gospels and that of how that works. But I want to give you another one this morning. This uh, is a book I've had since uh, seminary. It's called The History of the New Testament and its Times. And it's one of those books, I'm sure you all have them, that it just comes off your shelf all the time. You go back to it again and again and again. And one reason is because this book is laid out like the book of Revelation. What happens is, if you want to know about, uh, they phrase it, the, the Jewish root leading to the New Testament, you go to that chapter and it'll pick up about 300 B.C. and bring you right up through the New Testament times. Then, if you want to know about the Roman root, it'll do the same thing, but from the Roman perspective, the emphasis on Rome. And then there's one with the emphasis on Greece, and uh, etc. The same thing the book of Revelation does. It takes us through a cycle, and then it takes us through that same cycle again, using different imagery. And you'll remember we, we went through the, the, the cycle of the trumpets, and now we're going, or, or the, we went through the trumpets, cycle of the seals. Now we're going through the trumpets and we're back to the same thing. So that's the way Revelation works. And as we begin to grasp that, it begins to become a little more clear. Now you may remember the last time we were here, we mentioned that uh, Revelation is considered one of the most difficult books in the New Testament, or the Bible, it's period. And the 11th chapter is considered the most difficult chapter. And that's where we find ourselves, again, that's why it's going to take us uh, three messages to get through this, this 11th chapter, but I think they'll be good. You remember that two weeks ago, we titled the message, It's All About Us. You remember that? And we said the 11th chapter of Revelation is all about us. And it is, but it's not all about you. You need to get that distinction. It's not about you as an individual, it's about us as the church of Jesus Christ and what we as the church are supposed to be doing. And it, I have noticed that there's a, a, a current running through uh, conservative uh, theological circles now that is tending to come back more to an emphasis on the church collective rather than the individual. Uh, we have for years uh, put this uh, huge emphasis on uh, having an individual relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and that is an imperative. But that isn't the imperative. Because an individual relationship with Jesus Christ that doesn't morph into a corporate relationship with his bride, the church, is dysfunctional. There's something wrong with that. Because he designed the church collectively and calls it his bride. The church collectively is who has the mission of making him known to the world. So as we, as we look at this 11th chapter, it's about the church. Us collectively. That will help us. We are the church. We are the instrument that God has chosen to represent himself to the world. Now, as you look around at various churches, you may uh, think to yourself, well, gee, I, he could have picked a more uh, attractive instrument or a more precise instrument or uh, a, a more whatever instrument. But he did not. This is what he picked the church, by his design. And he thinks it is a beautiful thing. You may also remember, we, po we pointed out that in the book of Revelation there is really nothing new. 
There's nothing new here. It's a restatement of everything we've read in the Old Testament and the New Testament. In fact, uh, I had a professor years ago caution the class he was speaking to. He says, if in your course of theological studies you discover something new, beware. Beware. And ask yourself the question, of all the great minds for the last 2,000 years that have come before you didn't see this new thing, why should you be able to see this new thing? Now that's not to say it's impossible, but it's just to say it's very improbable. I, I learned, I went back there, spent a week in Ohio, well not a week, but the greater part of the week, spent some money to get there and all that. What did I learn that was new? Absolutely nothing. And that's a good thing. Because they don't need something new. We need this. We need something solid, something steady, something that's been there from eternity past and something that will be here into eternity future. We need the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, that's all good, but now we read here in, in Revelation about fire-breathing prophets. Two of them. Well, that's kind of cool, isn't it? I always think, I can't read Revelation without thinking of Spielberg and those guys, you know. And what they could do with this book. You know, here you got these, these prophets and, and they're out there and if anybody gives them any trouble, they boom, and burn them up, you know. And they, they call down plagues and they smite this and they smite that. And you got dragons and stuff and it, what, a, what, a, what a movie that would make. And that's the movie that John is seeing. He's seeing these things and then he's trying to write them down so that to communicate them to us. And then, you know, we, we get past the fire and, and we run right into olive trees. Now, what in the world do olive trees have to do with anything? And then, then we've got lampstands. And we have to deal with all that today, this morning. And, and make sense of it. And I think we can do it. Maybe a bit of a challenge, but we can do it. What this chapter really is, it's a reassurance that what Jesus said to Peter... What Jesus said to the apostles and what Jesus says to all the kingdom, the kingdom will come about. And what did he say to Peter? He said, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and what? And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We win. Yeah. What did he say to his apostles? That he had been given all power on heaven and on earth and he's going to give it to them and send them out into the world. We win. Read the kingdom of heaven parables, especially in, in Matthew. And, and what do they say? What do they say is going to happen with the kingdom of heaven here on this earth? It's going to start out small, and then what's it going to do? It's going to grow and grow and grow and grow. And the two, two uh, most good commonly known examples he uses are the mustard seed that starts out to those people in their day it was the smallest seed known and it grew grows into this huge tree and all the birds of the air can come and nest in it that's the kingdom of heaven that's what's happening right now same thing with the leaven you introduce this little tiny bit of leaven into all this dough and what happens it goes all through the dough you know I, I've got some really neat stuff at home that uh, I wonder where I have a pond you know, if you have a pond, it's just, it's a perennial maintenance nightmare. Yeah. And uh, keeping the bottom clean, I've got, you know, ultraviolet stuff to keep the water clean. Water's crystal clear, but you get all this gunk on the bottom. And how do you deal with it? So they, I bought some stuff the other day, and it's a bottle full of, of what are they, microbes? You know what they are? And, and you pour these guys in there. Now you can't see them, you know, because they're tiny, tiny, tiny. And they just spread out in there and have more little microbes and pretty soon they're eating up all your gunk. It's an amazing thing. And it happens unseen. You don't see them, but there they are. And that's the way the gospel is. Jesus introduced the gospel into the world. And from that, it's going to grow and grow and grow and grow. Now you say, well, pastor, what have you been drinking this morning? Obviously, the church isn't growing that much. The church is declining, maybe. 
in America. I forget the figures off the top of my head of how many churches close their doors every week. It's a large figure, a large number. But you cannot judge the gospel by looking at a little chunk of time like the last hundred years. We think a hundred years is a long time, but in gospel speak, it's not. And just because the church doesn't look like it's prospering today doesn't mean that next week God won't send a revival and revive the whole thing. We don't know. But I think I like that idea. I think that's a biblical idea. God didn't say to Peter, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church until the thing gets so tiny and is so declined that I have to rapture my four people that are left out of here and then kill everybody else. It's not there. What's there is the church is going to grow and grow and grow and grow and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Uh, if you want to read a, a really good book, the guy's uh, really good is J. Marcellus Kick and the title of his book is An Eschatology of Victory and it's, it's a great book it'll, it'll open your eyes to some of these eschatological things which is just end time stuff big words to say that but it's good so here we are and let's look and see what we have in uh, Revelation chapter 11. I'm going to pick it up here in verse, uh, just the beginning of verse 3. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses. Okay. Who's going to give these witnesses authority? Jesus, right? He's giving these two witnesses authority. It is important to understand that they get their authority from him. Those verses that, uh, that Jim read for us, you know. Matthew 28, 18. I have been given all authority under heaven and earth. So it's all been given to the Son by the Father. And then he says in Acts 1, 8, that you, the church will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Well, the Holy Spirit came when? In the next chapter of Acts, didn't it? Acts chapter 2. From that time on, everyone who accepts Jesus Christ is baptized with the power of the Holy Spirit. So you have the power, you have the resources, you have the commission, you have the authority to tell the world about Jesus. We have a divine commission, don't we? In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 through 20, what are we told? That we are Christ's ambassadors. Not that we will be, not that we might be, not that we can be, but the language is very specific. We are. That's what you are. You're not just some individual Christian out there blowing in the wind. You are an ambassador for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And, and you may be thinking, now, well, Pastor, I thought we were doing, I thought we were doing eschatology, not evangelism. I mean, you can't do one without the other because it's all in here. And we're talking about the mission of the church. In 2 Corinthians, it says this. It says, Christ reconciled us to himself. He reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We are Christ's ambassadors. That's your identity. That's your job. That's who you are. Because he reconciled you to him. And now he has given you the ministry of reconciliation, i.e. telling others about the salvation that's available in Jesus Christ. That's a huge mission. Well, back to our prophets, though. Why do we have two of them? You ever give that any thought? Wouldn't one fire-breathing prophet bringing down plagues be enough? I mean, now, come on. If one guy came in here and he was breathing fire, would you pay attention? <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't need two. I think one would be enough. Well, why not seven? 
Remember, seven is a significant number, isn't it, in the book of Revelation? But he has two. Why two? Well, we need to remember Revelation has its roots deep down in the Old Testament, don't we? And one of the reasons folks get in trouble when they start trying to interpret the book of Revelation is uh, they oftentimes come to the Lord, they get all excited about the Lord, and that's a good thing, and where do they want to go? They want to dive right into the book of Revelation and see what's going on. But you cannot understand it unless you know what's going on in the Old Testament and the New, New Testament that precedes the book of Revelation. Now actually I should have had Mike Dodds preach this sermon. <laughs> because it's full of legalese. Legal language. Two is a legal number. These two satisfy the quorum needed to establish reliable evidence in biblical jurisprudence. Right? Sure, you guys know. Deuteronomy chapter 19 verse 15 A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or any wrong in connection with any offense that has been committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or three can the truth be established. Wow. That's the Old Testament root to these two guys. Matthew chapter 18, the famous passage on, on uh, church discipline. In verse 16 it says this, But if he does not listen, if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Again, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 19. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. So when we have multiple witnesses, the witness is deemed to be true. And so the witness of the church is true according to the gospel. The witness of these two prophets is true. And I hope you see the progression. The Old Testament to the gospels to the epistles and now boom, here we are in Revelation. The constant threads that run all through scripture. These two satisfy that quorum. The gospel is God's truth, established by his divinely commissioned witnesses, and that is who? You, the church. You ever, never thought of yourself like that, probably, have you? You are divinely commissioned. Now, some of you are going to go home tonight, and, you, and you're going to pray, and you're going to say, could I have just a little of that fire-breathing thing to go with this? <laughs> and he's going to say no. <laughs> Our job is to simply tell people about Christ. Witnesses. Again, legalese, isn't it? Witnesses. What do witnesses do? They tell what they know. They tell what they saw. They tell what they heard. That's what we're supposed to do. Now I'm going to tell, say something now that may be a little radical for some of you. But I think we, me included, have had this whole witnessing thing a little, a little askew over the years. Because I've preached many a sermon and told people that all you need to do to lead people to Christ is tell them what Jesus has done in your life. You've probably heard many sermons about that. Many pastors tell you that. I'm beginning to believe that may not be it. Because where is the focus if I'm telling people about what Christ has done in my life? And I can spin a pretty good yarn. I was one of those real bad guys all mucked up and did all sorts of stuff and I can tell you how God changed my life. But wh where's the focus? It's on, it's on me. Now by extension it goes to God, but it's on me. Maybe instead, now I'm, just, I'm just saying maybe, maybe instead we should put the focus on him to start with. 
not so it's okay to tell people what he's done for you and that and the other thing that's that's good but what if we put the focus on him to start with you need a savior there's a God who came to earth and gave his life for you to get you into heaven not to save your marriage not to cure your drug habit not to if, take care of your financial problems though those things may be residuals we don't know but we do know this he came that we might have life and he's talking about spiritual life eternal life so why don't we and, and this is harder I've been thinking about this how do I tell somebody about Christ leaving me out as much as possible and putting him in as much as possible it's harder and that's probably why we kind of drifted to the other side we are his witnesses not our witnesses now that's not an indictment I'm as guilty as anybody of that it's just I, I think it's just something it's a new uh, or not a new but a renewed strain of theological thought that I see out there now and I think it's a good thing well let's, let's handle a couple of objections with three of them to be exact to witnessing okay because I, I you know last last time we talked about this we talked about witnessing and uh, uh, somebody asked me afterwards well well what about when you're in an environment where you you're not supposed to witness hmm well I don't know let's think about that for a minute Sometimes, especially if you work for a large company, they have policies against what they usually term proselytizing or whatever. Now, what are you as a Christian supposed to do if you're in that environment? Now, one verse that immediately comes to mind is in Acts, where Peter stood up and he says, I must obey God rather than men. So I don't care what the company policy is. I don't care what the boss says. I'm going to tell people about Jesus. Now on the surface, that sounds real good. That sounds very holy. And you know, boy, this person's filled with the Spirit. Until you read what Jesus said about the relationship between employees and employers. When you're on the employee's dime, what are you supposed to be doing? you're supposed to be taking care of the employees interests you're supposed to be doing that to the highest standards that you can so that at the end of the day if they should find out you're a Christian they're gonna say wow so-and-so is one of those Christians they're the best worker in the department you see Jesus said a lot about the relationship in the New Testament it was termed slaves and masters we don't have slaves anymore well some of you may think you're slaves but it depends on who you work for but but uh, that's what he's talking about and he says you know what if, if you're a slave you be the best slave you can be and he says the same thing as the masters by the way if you're the boss you should be the best boss you can possibly be and take care of your people so let me say this if you're if you're an environment in an environment where you're not supposed to discuss these sorts of things don't oh, don't but here's what you can do you can do your job so well you can have so much integrity that just maybe somebody will come up to you and say hey I hear you go to church all every Sunday can you tell me about that now you're still on the company's dime so what do you do you say I'd love to let's get together for coffee on our break or let's get together after work for beer yeah you can talk about the gospel over a beer whatever it is get off the, the company's time and then tell them and you know what isn't that what Peter said to do first Peter chapter 3 verse 13 3 verse 15 sanctify the Lord God always in your hearts and always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks the reason for the hope that is within you ah 
That's a little different than the confrontational evangelism we're sometimes told we need to do. Uh, confrontational evangelism rarely works. I won't say it never works. God can use anything. But it rarely works. But I think Peter's got it here. You know, uh, Peter says a lot of dumb things through the, the New Testament, doesn't he? But I think this time he's got it right. Always be ready. Oh, and I didn't finish that verse, by the way. You're supposed to do this how? With humility and reverence. Okay. Nothing worse than an arrogant person trying to tell somebody about Christ. So always be ready to give an answer to anyone who should ask a reason for the hope that is in you with humility and reverence. Puts a little different slant on it, doesn't it? That's the way to do it. Okay, here's another objection. Well, if I, if I tell people about Jesus and he's, he's doing this and that, uh, they're going to think I'm nuts. Okay, so you're in good company. Acts chapter 26, verse 24. Now the context is, uh, Paul is before Festus, the, the Roman uh, governor, and, and he's telling him about Jesus. And, and here's what Festus says. As he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you're out of your mind. Okay. Well, if Paul was out of his mind for telling people about Jesus, I'm not going to be too insulted if they tell me I'm out of my mind, because I think that's pretty good company. I'd like to hang out with Paul. Wouldn't bother me. Finally, another common objection, ob objection is that it just doesn't work in society. It just doesn't fit in society. And that's true, it doesn't. But it's not about society. It's about the kingdom of God. And that's what we're about. Oh, well, let me hit, hit one more, just for kicks. People say, I don't like, or they may not say it so much, but they think it, I don't like to tell people about Jesus because when I do, I go away feeling like a failure. Because most of them reject your message, don't they? Again, pretty good company. Most of them rejected Jesus' message when he was here in the flesh, too. So, you can be in the company of Paul, you can be in the company of Jesus. I'd say that's pretty good folks to hang out with. Yeah. We need to understand that our job as ambassadors, as witnesses, as emissaries of Christ is to tell people about him. That's our job. Once we have told them, that is success. We can't save anybody. We can't argue them into the kingdom. We can't beg them into the kingdom. That's the Holy Spirit's work. Jesus himself said, No man comes to me unless he is drawn by the Father. Okay? So our job is to deliver the message and leave it alone. Uh, James Kennedy used to say, uh, success, the de definition of successful evangelism is this. And I think he gets this a little bit from Peter. Taking advantage of every opportunity to share the gospel and leaving the results to God. See, we aren't responsible for results. Because as soon as we become responsible for results, we're saying Jeremiah was a failure, Isaiah was a failure, Jesus was a failure. And we know that's not true. Poor Isaiah and Jeremiah, they beat their heads against the wall for years. And finally, they got so fed up with Jeremiah, they just sawed him in half. Now, that's rejection. So, okay, we, we know what our mission is, but you still haven't got to the good stuff about the fire-breathing prophets. We want to know about them. Well, before we get there, though, notice... He's given all authority to these witnesses. Now he tells us who they are in the next verse. These are. See how it starts out? The two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. Jeez. Now fire-breathing prophets. Now they're lampstands. Now they're olive trees. What in the world are they? And what do these three things have to do with one another? It's enough to make your head spin. 
Just about the time we think we have the prophets identified, John says, hey, here they are. There are these things over here. To understand, we must travel back in time about 600 years to 535 B.C. This is a time of great discouragement for God's people. You know, the Assyrians came in and they wiped out Israel. The Babylonians came in. They wiped out Judah. Persians rise up. They wipe out everybody. And they, they take some of God's people away. Take them to Babylon. That's where Daniel is when he writes, when you read the book of Daniel, he's there. Well, Cyrus comes to the throne, King Cyrus, Persia, and uh, he lets them go. He lets them go back to do what? To rebuild the temple. And not only that, but he gives them resources. He gives them money and gives them a letter of passage and all that sort of thing. And they go and they start to rebuild the temple. And they're oh so happy. You know, they're just full of exhilaration. They begin laying the foundation with high hopes. But then opposition from the outside and discouragement from within cause them to abandon the project. Opposition from the outside and discouragement from within cause them to abandon the project. Now, how many applications could we make to that? You know, you can go on ad infinitum. You know, how many times do people go into something with great hopes only to have them dashed by opposition from without or from within? You know, people start businesses with great hopes and they fail. People go into marriages with great hopes and it fails. Uh, people start churches with great hopes and it fails. And these guys are doing God's work. They're rebuilding God's temple. How can he allow them to fail? Well, does the temple get rebuilt? Yes. In that time, yes. So they did not fail. But if you read Zechariah, it's kind of like a mini revelation in a lot of ways. There are a lot of things there. And if you look in Zechariah, chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, you'll see something. And the angel who talked with me came and woke me. Oh, kind of like John in Revelation, huh? The angel comes to him and delivers the message to him. Like a man who is awakened out of his sleep, and he said to me, What do you see? So now Zechariah is seeing things as John did. I said, I see, and behold, what? A lampstand of gold. Oh, now we've got lampstands coming in here. With a bowl on top of it and seven lamps on it, with seven lips on each of the lamps and that are on the top of it. And what? There are olive trees. Hmm. Olive trees. How many olive trees? Two. Interesting. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl, the other on the left. And I said to the angel who talked with me, What are these, my lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? I said, No, my lord. Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Now get this. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain. And he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. And then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also complete it. Now, we could spend a lot of time deciphering all that and explaining it all, but the bottom line is this. The lampstands are God's spirit, or the lampstand is God's people. The olive trees are God's spirit. And how are God's people going to conquer? Not by might, 
Not by power, but how? By God's Spirit. God guarantees that. That's pretty good. So the church, we may look around here in the beginning of the 21st century and we may say, well, the church is impotent, the church is weak, the, the church is all mucked up with bad theology, there's liberals hiding in the bushes, you know, it's just, the whole thing's a mess. God says, not so. My spirit is working, unseen, like my little microbes in my pond, like the leaven, like the mustard seed is growing into a great plant. Where have we seen lampstands before? Just recently. Revelation chapter 1, verse 12. You remember? The seven lampstands, one for each church. Lampstands are familiar. So here are the two prophets, the church... Symbolic of God's Spirit, the olive trees stand near the lampstand and supply it with oil. This is how the church will triumph. Not by programs, not by politics, not by slick presentations, but by faithfully preaching and sharing the gospel and letting the Holy Spirit do His work. Yeah, you know, it, 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 it's interesting to me because I pastor this church, which is, I think I could say across the spectrum, if it leans anywhere, it leans politically conservative. Uh, but the group of churches we're aligned with, if anything, they're liberal. And so when I go to the, my, the pastor's meetings and things, I have to remind my liberal friends sometimes that when they get to heaven, there are going to be some political conservatives there. They're shocked. <laughs> They're shocked. But so I have to remind we conservatives that when we get to heaven, there are going to be some liberals there. Because God's Spirit wafts all the way across the spectrum. It won't be by political power that the church prospers. It won't be by great programs. It won't even be by great presentations. But by faithfully preaching and sharing the gospel, God's word. Well, what about all this other stuff? We still got the fire, we got the plagues, we got the drought, we're running out of time. What this is, verses 5 and 6, it's God's assurance of the victory for the church. God through the centuries has always delivered his people from satanic attack. Always. Notice the allusion in these uh, last two verses to Moses. Turning the water into blood. little mosaic there, isn't it? You know the plagues? Uh, Moses called down plagues and God delivered his people, didn't he? Uh, there's allusion there. He's able to stop the rain. Well, who did that? Elijah, didn't he? Stopped the rain, wiped out the prophets of Baal, looked impossible, but he won. God delivered his people. So don't go by what we see in this little snapshot of 100 years or whatever it is we're looking at, 200 years. God isn't finished working yet. Yes, it may look bleak. Yes, this is a time of great struggle, great tribulation. What time are we talking about? This three and a half years, this 1260 days. What time frame is that? Remember? That's the time from Christ's first coming to Christ's second coming. There is going to be an end to all this tribulation, trouble, and strife. But as long as Christ tarries, what did Jesus himself say? In this world you will have tribulation. How did John describe himself in the opening chapter of the book of Revelation? He's talking to the churches. He says, I am your fellow worker, partaker in the tribulation. So it's going to be tough. But we win. 
John described himself like this, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation. We can take great comfort in all of this because God has promised his church will overcome. You go back to what he said to Peter, I will build my church. So who's building the church? Us? No. He is. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So don't go merely by what you see. Don't go merely by what you hear. Go by what God says in his word. We take great comfort in this. So take heart, Christians. Whatever you are struggling with will pass. It will come to an end. And we will one day overcome. And how will we do it? Again, Zechariah. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Now that's what I want you to take home with you. And I also want you to take home 1 Peter 3.15. If you don't know it, memorize it. At the very least, mark it in your Bible. But memorize it. You're all intelligent people. You know, I have people tell me all the time, oh, I can't memorize anything. Well, what's your phone number? Boom, boom, boom. Oh, I thought you couldn't memorize anything. Well, I can't. Then they get a new phone number, and in a couple of days, boom, boom, boom. But you can do it. You're intelligent folks. Best advice you'll ever get. Read your Bible and do what it says. That's all you got to do. Pray with me. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your promise of overcoming, of, of victory, and the thank you that you allow us to be a part of what we presume to be uh, the great struggle of the church to survive. And yet we know that it's not a matter, matter of survival, it's a matter of triumph, of triumphal victory over sin and death and all of those things. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of it. Give us opportunity this week to give someone a reason for the hope that is in us. And remind us, Lord, to do that with humility and reverence. In your name, Jesus. Amen.